This isn't me watching South Park and just repeating some of that cartoon to you. I read you from official Mormon books what it teaches about the topic. Why do I feel Mormonism denies God? It's because the way they conceive of God um, is that he used to be a man and that he became God through obedience to a law that is outside of himself. And that's not the biblical conception of God. In the King Fall Discourse, Joseph Smith said, We have imagined and supposed that God has been God from all eternity. I will refute that statement and take away the veil so that you may see. Joseph Smith made it a big part of his ministry to prove that God used to be a man and he ascended to Godhood. That's not the biblical conception of God. And so to me, that puts it in a position of, of being kind of outside the pale of true biblical Christianity. God, an exalted man. This is King Follett's sermon preached by Joseph Smith, 1805 to 1844. This is churchofjesuschrist.org. Okay. So I'm not going to some unbelieving website that's trying to disprove Mormonism. You scroll down to here to this section, God, an exalted man. I will go back to the beginning before the world was to show what kind of being God is. What sort of being was God in the beginning? Open your ears and hear all ye ends of the earth, for I'm going to prove it to you by the Bible and to tell you the designs of God in relation to the human race and why he interferes with the affairs of man. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today and the great God who holds this world in its orbit and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves, in all the person, image, and very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God and received instruction from and walked, talked, and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. In order to understand the subject of the dead for consolation of those who mourn and for the loss of their friends, it is necessary we understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. For I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. Joseph Smith taught plainly that God used to be a man. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. Two statements right there, clearly promoting the idea that God became God through obedience to what is called the God, um, the law of eternal progression, okay, or the eternal law of progression. Now, I want to show you something else. This book is called Achieving a Celestial Marriage, okay? It is put out by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, okay? I am not at all taking an unbelieving refutation or critique. Achieving a Celestial Marriage Student Manual put out by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Chapter 1, Celestial Marriage, the key to man's destiny. Now, I want to read this to you. This is going to be a bit of a process, but you're going to see this is essential teaching from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. God was once a man who by obedience advanced to his present state of perfection. Through obedience and celestial marriage, we may progress to the point where we become like God. You see that? Now let's go to the first paragraph. Proclaiming the divine potential within man, John Taylor once wrote, Knowest thou not that thou art a spark of deity, struck from the fire of his eternal blaze, and brought forth in the midst of everlasting burning? Elder B.H. Roberts stated, Man has descended from God. In fact, he is of the same race as the gods. His descent has not been from a lower form of life, but from the highest form of life. Okay? In other words, man is, in the most literal sense, a child of God. This is not only true of the spirit of man, but also of his body. Can you see the implications of these two statements? Okay? As they relate to you and your eternal destiny. Elder James B. Talmadge did. He declared, in his mortal condition, man is God in embryo. However, any individual now a mortal being may attain to the rank and sanctity of Godship. How is this possible? What course of action will you bring this potential to fruition? As you study this lesson, look for the answers to these questions. Okay? So now we go down to here. Study instructions. It tells you where to read. 
So you can read Doctrine and Covenants 45, 49, 15 to 17. Doctrine and Covenants 131, 1 to 4. And Doctrine and Covenants 132. Okay. Now here we go. Points to ponder. God became God in obedience to law. It was late afternoon as we sat in my office, but I felt the time had been well spent. He sat silently now, obviously contemplating the ramifications of the things we had been discussing. Right here. Of the things we had been discussing. We had talked of God, how he became God, and of what it meant in terms of our own exaltation. Finally, he spoke. What is this law of exaltation which you keep speaking? Okay. Well, it involves the whole of the gospel law. Everything required of us by God is associated with this law. But the major crowning point of the law which man must obey is eternal marriage. Therein lies the keys of eternal life, or as Doctrine and Covenants puts it, eternal lives. In other words, in other words, an eternal increase in posterity. Then what you're saying is that God became God by obedience to the gospel program, which culminates in eternal marriage. Okay, that's what he's saying. Through obedience to law, we can become like our father in heaven. Yes. Do you realize the implications of this doctrine as far as you are concerned? I think so. If God became God by obedience to all of the gospel law, with the crowning point being the celestial law of marriage, then th that's the only way I can become a God. Right. And it is the law that assists us in reaching that potential. It tells us what we must do to gain the ultimate freedom. In fact, it is by obedience to law that we have progressed to our present position. You mean we have always been governed by law? Always. You and are an eternal being. You were never created and you cannot be destroyed, but you can advance, progress, and develop by obedience to law. Then Hamlet's question to be or not to be is not the right question? Right. Not in the ultimate sense, at least. Order means law, and that law is the law of the celestial kingdom. Any who come unto that kingdom must obey that law. But I thought godhood meant freedom. If I have to do all of these things to become God, am I really free? You have got it wrong. It was the Savior who said, if you continue in my word, that is, obey my law. Then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So, by obedience to law, we learn truths from which we are free, but not free from the law. Can you see that? I think so. I can only be a god if I act like God. Exactly right. Can you imagine the state of the universe if imperfect gods were allowed to spawn their imperfections throughout space? If beings who did not have law under their subjection were free to create worlds? I guess that would be pretty disastrous. But I'm not sure. I see why celestial marriage becomes the crowning apex of this progression. Marriage doesn't seem directly related to the creation of universes. Oh, but don't limit yourself by mortal perspective. God himself has declared his own reasons for existing. Remember that he said, for this is my work and my glory. I see his purpose is to bring past the immortality and eternal life of man, which involves giving birth to spirit children and setting them on the road of exaltation. And... If that is to be done, you must have an exalted man and an exalted woman. Exactly. An exalted man and woman who have been joined together in an eternal marriage. If this man and woman were obedient to all gospel laws except celestial marriage, what would be the result? They still could not be gods. Now I understand. Celestial marriage is the crowning obedience of the gospel. Right, I said with a smile. And with that comment, I think we can end the discussion. So, Mormonism fundamentally teaches that God became God through obedience to a law that was outside of himself and that we can become God through obedience to certain laws, okay? That is exactly what it teaches. It's what Joseph Smith taught in the King Follett Discourse and it's what achieving a celestial marriage teaches, okay? Now, this used to be common doctrine. It was taught regularly in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And yet, and I'm not picking on you at all, we had somebody come in and say, I'm Mormon, and they weren't even aware of this doctrine. So, that's something important that I want to point out, right? This is very important Mormon doctrine. 
that you can become God through obedience to a gospel law that is outside of yourself. And that's what the God of this world did before. This is profoundly unbiblical. This has nothing to do with biblical Christianity. It has nothing to do with the Bible's conception of who God is and how he became to be God, right? Nothing to do with that. Let me, uh, let me show you. We just learned from the King Follett discourse and from achieving a celestial marriage that God became God by obedience to gospel law. Another God made him and then he became God by obedience to the gospel law. And so too, you can become a God if you will obey the gospel law with its crowning ordinance, celestial marriage. But here's what Isaiah 43, 10 says. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be anyone after me. It's very, very clear here that God says he's the only God. Before him, no God was formed, and there will be none after him. That directly contradicts Mormon or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaching. And that is why I say that I believe the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormon doctrine is not in line with the scriptures. So I hope that was helpful for you guys. Ultimately, I wanted you guys to see from the horse's mouth, right? What official LDS teaching is. Because ultimately, you shouldn't just take my words for it. If this is what they teach, it should be in their words. And so we saw that they were. There were some passages it said to study. Doctrine and Covenants 49, 15 to 17. Doctrine and Covenants 131, 1 to 4. Doctrine and Covenants 130, verse 2. A quad is the Mormon books. This is a quad. Holy Bible in the King James translation, edited by Joseph Smith. Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. There are four holy books. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay? So th this is what it looks like. So this is Doctrine and Covenants 49, 15 to 17. And again, verily I say unto you, that whoso forbiddeth to marry is not ordained of God, for marriage is ordained of God unto men. Wherefore, it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they should twain shall become one flesh, and all this that the earth might answer the end of its creation, and that it might be fi filled with the measure of man according to his creation before the world was made. So that's the first one. Doesn't seem too egregious. Okay. Let's now go to the next one they reference. Doctrine and Covenants 131 verses 1 to 4. 131, right there. Celestial marriage is essential to an exaltation to the heavens. In the celestial glory, there are three heavens or degrees. And in order to obtain the highest, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if he does not, he cannot obtain it. And he may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have an increase. And if we go to 132, you can see I've marked this out. If we go to 132, 15 to 20, listen to this. 132, 15 to 20. Therefore, if a man marry him a wife in the world, and he marry her not by me nor my word, this is celestial marriage, and he covenant with her so long as he is in the world, and she with him, their covenant and marriage are not of force when they are dead and when they are out of the world. Therefore, they are not bound by any law when they are out of the world. He's saying their marriage doesn't persist into eternity. Therefore, when they are out of the world, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are appoint, appointed angels in heaven, which angels are ministering servants, to minister for those who are worthy of a far more and exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For these angels did not abide by my law. Therefore, they cannot be enlarged, but remain separately and singly without exaltation in their saved condition to all eternity and from henceforth are not gods. Do you see that? And from henceforth are not gods, but are angels of God forever and ever. So if you get into a marriage that isn't a celestial marriage, you are not a god, okay? You can't become a god. And again, verily I say unto you, if a man marry a wife and make a covenant with her for a time and for all eternity, and if that covenant is not by me nor my word, which is my law, and is not sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise there, through him whom I have appointed and appointed unto this power, then it is not valid neither or of force when they are out of the world. 
because they are not joined by me, saith the Lord, neither by my word. When they are out of the world, it cannot be received there because the angels and the gods are appointed there by whom they cannot pass and cannot therefore inherit my glory for the house is a house of order. And again, verily I say unto you, if a man might marry a wife by my word, which is my law, and by my new and everlasting covenant, and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed, unto whom I have appointed this power and the keys of the priesthood, and it shall be unto them, ye shall come forth in the first resurrection, and if it be the first resurrection and the next resurrection, and shall inherit thrones, kingdom, principalities, powers, dominions, all heights and depths, then shall it be written in the Lamb's book of life that he shall commit no murder, and shed innocent blood and if ye abide by my covenant and commit no murder whereby to shed innocent blood it shall be done unto them throughout all eternity and they shall pass by the angels and the gods which are set there and their exaltation and glory in all things and hath been sealed upon their heads which glory shall fullness and continuation of the seeds forever then look at verse 20 guys then shall they be gods because they have no end Therefore shall they be from everlasting to everlasting because they continue. Then they are above all because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods because they have all power and the angels are subject to them. How do you become a God? You, cut, you become a God by obedience to gospel law. And the crowning obedience of gospel law is celestial marriage. Let's go back. To the last set of verses that were quoted. Doctrine and Covenants 130 verse 2. And shall the same sociality which exists among us here will exist among us there. Only it will be coupled with eternal glory which glory we do not now enjoy. There's another passage on it. So. What did we just read? Joseph Smith in the King Follett sermon said. We have imagined and supposed that God has been God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. And he taught that God used to be a man and became God through obedience to the gospel law. So that's the first one. Second one, we read achieving a celestial marriage, which talks about celestial marriage being the crowning achievement of gospel law so that through celestial marriage, you may attain to godhood. And then we finally read doctrine and covenants and especially 132 verse 20. If you want to become a God, if you want to surpass the angels and the gods, you must undergo celestial marriage so that you can have this crowning achievement into the new heavens and new earth. So I've proven from three Mormon documents that Mormonism teaches unequivocally that men can become gods through obedience to the law that is outside themselves. And not only that, but that God himself, our God of this world, of this universe, himself used to be a man and became God through obedience to the gospel law. Jess 2 says, what is celestial marriage? Celestial marriage is a marriage between two Mormons in the temple, and it has to undergo certain rituals and ceremonies to seal it as a celestial marriage. If you want to become a God in Mormonism, you have to undergo this celestial marriage that is grounded in temple marriage. Okay, very important idea. All of this, I simply contrast with Isaiah 43.10. And please, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We went through all the Mormon teaching on this. What does Isaiah 43.10 say? You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me was no God formed, nor will there be anyone after me. There you go. God makes it clear that there was no God before him. He wasn't created to be a man who could be exalted. And there will be none after him. Right? That's, it clearly teaches that. This is why I disagree emphatically and fundamentally with Mormonism. Because its doctrines teach that you can become a God. And that our God became a God through obedience to a law that is outside himself. And this is profoundly unbiblical. That was a great question. I want you to know that was a great, great question. I appreciate you asking it. I hope that was helpful. I hope you feel uh, more encouraged and um, like you have a stronger understanding of Mormonism. This isn't me, you know, watching, uh, I, oh, South Park. This isn't me watching South Park and just repeating some of that cartoon to you. I read you from official Mormon books what it teaches about the topic. Official Mormon books, okay? And that's what it says. And it's profoundly unbiblical. 
Hey guys, Pastor Channer here, and we try to answer a lot of people's questions here on the channel. If you have your own question that you would like to ask, please put it in the comments below, and we'll try to answer it as soon as we can. We may even make a video about it in order to address it, okay? So thanks for being here. Take care. God bless. Bye now.